Uh, before I start, I want to thank uh, Saul for giving me this opportunity to present this topic, which is really close to my heart. Uh, I, I would like to ask um, in the group how many people have been working on microservices and generally for more than a year now? Okay. Uh, the, the reason I'm asking it is because as, as the time will go on and you will work more and more in microservices for people who have already been working for some time, will realize the importance of this topic. I know this is quite a boring topic generally to talk about documentation to a bunch of developers. I'm a developer myself. So I know whenever somebody tells me to document, I'm like, that's, that's not for me. Just look at the code and you will know what's going on. <laughs> and I'm sure it's the same for this group. But if you see the way microservices work over a period of time, you realize that it's important to have some breadcrumbs along the way, some treasure map, to find your way back into the microservices that are already existing in your ecosystem. Because soon it can become like a swamp. So I know it's towards the end of the day and people definitely want to go home. So I'm, it's quite a boring topic. So I just want to tell what are the key takeaways that I want to present to you. First thing is don't let your microservices be like Stonehenge. Now I'm sure everybody knows what is a Stonehenge. It's, it's a formation of rocks somewhere. <laughs> and people have been guessing what it is. Definitely, it would have been there for a reason, given that there are heavy rocks put on one, one top of other. But nobody has been able to tell why it is formed. So definitely we don't want our systems to be like that after a few years when we move on to other projects or other companies. And people look at the microservices that you have written and say, this is just like a Stonehenge. I really don't know what's going on here. Looking at the code, I understand, but then I don't know how to interact with it. So that's the first thing, think about it. When you are starting on this journey, please think about this one. Second bit which I would like to talk about is to understand the nature of the data. So when I'm saying data, it's nothing to do with your application data. It's nothing to do with what, what's going on in your application. It's basically the data or the information that is required to understand your application. So please think about what is the data that you would like to be present even after the microservice is in production and you have left the team so that it doesn't become like a Stonehenge. People still have that information about the system itself. And the third thing which is really important, which I'm, I myself am struggling still to see how to radiate this information outside so that it's easily available for anyone to just have a look at it and understand what it is all about. So I don't have to, of, of course developers can look into the code, but then that's, well, that's the next thing which I want to talk about is, are just the developers the consumers of this information or is there other people who want to know about it? So let's talk about why do we need all this documentation. If you say generally, we just think about when developers only think about developers. And we say, oh, look at the code and you'll know. But if you look at the whole system, it's not just the developers who are involved. In a team, you have business people, you have the developers, of course. And then you also have the operational team, or the, you know, in different, different organizations, they are called differently. They can be delivery engineering, they can be DevOps or the operational team in general who handle your releases and then who carry the pagers in the night and who get woken up. So obviously you need to make sure you have enough information to give to not only the business but also to the operational team. Now if you see the expanse of this, it's, it's a big spectrum. Now people might ask, why do the business want to know what's going on? They, they give the requirement and that's it. And we just make sure we you know, we have implemented it properly. But let me tell you a very good example that recently happened with me. I had my product manager walk up to me and say, hey Supriya, you are telling me that to implement this requirement, it's going to take you 
whatever a month, what exactly are you going to do with it? Like how how is it going to happen? And then I had to actually show him, and he was he was really patient. I'd actually show him how the data is going to flow through different microservices and what are those few microservices that I have to build for giving him that requirement. And he was quite impressed. And after that, most of our meetings and most of our conversations always started with that big massive diagram, which I used to show him that, okay, right now we are implementing this one and next we'll be doing this and next we'll be doing that. And he was really impressed because it was like he felt he was being taken on a journey along with me. And he was, he was very, very com comfortable when I told him it's going to take me so much time to implement this. And this, these are things that I need to do before you get anything out of it. So that's why I think it's very important to take the business people along the journey and give them the right view of the system. Development view, of course, the developers want to know what's going on. Because if I want to consume an endpoint which is already there given by a microservice, I should know how to do it. I should know what is the request that has to be sent to the microservice and what is the type of response that I'm going to get. From the operational point of view, once the microservice goes in production, you need to support it. So if at all at any point your pager goes, you want to know how do I fix it? What's going on? What is the data that I can get out of this different systems like all the operation systems that were mentioned earlier by Andy and John, like Neuralink or Splunk or you know, all your monitoring and alerting systems. So obviously you need to make sure that your documentation is adequate for all these different people around the business itself. This is a, don't get too much bogged down with, with this graph. It's a very hypothetical graph that I have put up. What is more important to notice is how is the data being, if you see generally, we are documenting a lot of things. People think we, we don't, but we are actually documenting a lot of things. You will, you will see that business people, your BAs or product managers will be giving you requirements in some form. It can be a one-liner written somewhere on a lean kit card, or it can be a massive big requirement document with a picture of a, of a screen, or it can be in any form and shape. So that is your requirement. So if you look at this diagram over here, as the, as the time progresses for your uh, project, so from the, in this, you can imagine the timeline to be the lifetime of your project and beyond. And if you look at the blue line which goes, which is basically how your business requirements are being sent to you. So those are not changing too much. Like once the requirement is given to you, obviously there will be small changes here and there, but while your team is implementing it, the requirement is not going to change radically. And those, so the, if you see the blue line is pretty much like a step with a small fluctuations in between. So what that denotes is the requirements are coming in at a pretty steady rate and it just the deviations or the degree of change is not so much. The red line shows the development. So the type of documentation that you're doing, it can be in the form of read me in your git or it can be any, any you know, um, maybe hand-drawn pictures to show how your architecture is going to be with different microservices. It can be anything. And that type of documentation that you do initially would be changing quite a lot because you are still trying to formulate how would you design your system itself. And over the period of time, the changes will happen as you maybe split your microservices or merge them together or add new ones to them. So obviously the documentation will be uh, sort of initially high, but then over a period of time, it, it will know when it will change. The, the green line that you see is more around operational type of documentation. So when I'm saying operational, it is basically information around SLAs, or it can be information like how is your infrastructure uh, available, or how is it designed, or how do I do a deployment of your of, of a microservice? All those type of documentation initially it will be fluctuating as you keep adding it or making it more and more mature. And over the period of time, you can see the line keeps going up because obviously you will have once your service is in production. You'll have some kind of troubleshooting guide going on where if your service goes down, you want to know how to fix it. And with that data, it keeps on increasing. Similarly, there will be information such as logs, a lot of logs that are generated or radiated out of the system. So all the data keeps on increasing. So you can see that there's different type of data and every the way, the nature of the data that changes is different for business development and the operational view. 
So this kind of shows the significance of how do we collect the data. So now I'll explain what, what I mean by rumors and facts in a minute. But if you see, if you look at this pyramid, as you, when you are developing, when, when, the, when the project is going on, that's when the business requirements play a maximum role. Once the project goes into production, once when the whole ecosystem goes into production, then operational part is what makes more uh, sense and what is most sought after. Because once your application, once your uh, suite of microservices is in production, obviously, always you want to know how it is performing in production. The different logs that are getting generated, how, whether you are meeting your SLAs properly or not. So that type of information is what would be generally mostly used once your application goes into production. During development phase, obviously you need the facts, such as you know your production logs and all those things, but you also need to know what are the business requirements. So now that brings us to the two words that I have put over there, rumors and facts. So this, these, these are the terms that we have coined within REA. There's nothing to do with outside REA. But to give you a context of what exactly a rumor is, uh, everybody knows what, what a rumor is, right? Rumor is something like, when if, I, if, if you tell me something and if I ask you, well, how did you come to know? You might say, ah, oh, this guy told me. And then if I go and ask that person, he might just point to somebody else, and so on and so forth. So, Rumors are generally started with people who are talking to each other. So if you see our business requirements are just rumors because they are being told. So even though we write a document about it, obviously somebody is telling you, this is what I need. That's why we are calling them as rumors. Facts are more in type of information that, are, that is collected from the system itself. For example, the logs, the access logs, for example, can be a very good, it's a very good example of what are facts. Because they are real-time happenings that, that's going on in your system. They're not rumors, they are actually happening. Now, if you see from a business perspective to the operational perspective, there are more rumors on the business side and more facts on the operational side. And we need to collect both of them. Let's have a closer look on what exactly rumors are and what are facts. So like I mentioned earlier, rumors are manual, they are being told, they are being documented. Facts are just automated. So facts are automated, automatically generated data, whereas rumors are more manual. If I tell you, if I hand you a document right now, and I say, this document was produced a year ago, and this was, this is the state of one of the applications in REA. Your confidence level might be better, but against, if I, if I present you a log file, of an application which is running right now in production, but the log file generated was a year ago. So obviously when you look at a log file which is generated a year ago versus a requirement document which was written a year ago, your confidence level in the requirement document which will, much, will be much higher against the log file. Because you might just look at the log file and say, that doesn't make sense, I want to know what's going on right now because this is something which is one year ago. But requirement, obviously, may not have changed so much because the system is already in production. You may ask, you may ask a few questions like, what happened after that? Has anything changed? And I might say, nothing has changed. This was the last requirement that was implemented. So obviously, your confidence level in that would be much better against the confidence level in the fact. So one thing to remember here is the confidence level in fact decreases rapidly over time. And obviously, after, after a certain point, the data is obsolete. You don't want to really read that data anymore. Whereas the confidence levels in rumors will not decrease that fast. And you can always validate it against the source. So if I tell you, product manager has given this requirement, obviously you'll have a higher confidence level against anything that is system generated at that point. So all that, whatever I presented earlier was a good theory. This is all great. We have different dimensions of data. But then, how do we present all this? I think that's a bigger question. And that's really challenging. So before, before, I, pre before I show you different things on how to present, I would like to give a short demo on what, what we tried to do. And I, the reason why I'm saying tried to do is not because it's not perfect. Obviously, we are still in the process of collecting that facts and rumors and trying to merge them together and finding out what would be a meaningful way of showing it. 
So what I have today is quite a, a rudimentary working model that we tried to put together uh, at Ariel. So this is a very crude UI that we generated. So what you see over here is a catalog of all the different microservices that are there in our system, in one of one part of, of Unreal. And you can see over here the description is all weird and it's all different because it is being picked up from the readme files of the Git repositories. So this is all taken from the corresponding readme as of now. Okay, so this is the, uh, you can call it not really a fact, but also not a rumor, because it's what's, what's the state of the system as of now from the readings. So there are different things going on here. And if you see on the top, we tried to give business processes. So these are the different business processes that, that were documented at one point in time. And if I just try to show you. So if you see over here, the way we try to document the business process. So now this business process is completely manually documented, whatever you see on the top, because it has not changed since the time it is. So even today, this is true. And if you see the components involved, some of them are manually documented, but the graph is automatically generated by the system, depending on the information that we collect. So here you can see how we are trying to connect a business process, which is whatever create to be. It tells you what that business process is doing. The roles, so basically who are the people who should be knowing about this business process. And then what are the different microservices or different components that actually play a part in that business process. So here we are trying to, re trying to connect a requirement with the different microservices that would be uh, taking part or taking part in implementation of that particular requirement. So I'm just coming back to my. So let me. I, I'll, I'll come into the. Uh, I'll tell the more details about the implementation of that. Um, how how we are presenting that data. So just to. Just to give you a quick overview, the UI is a different it's a different microservice, and you can treat it like a peripheral, so you can replace it with whatever you want. That was just a crude UI that we had developed, so that's not really that interesting, I would say. So, like I mentioned earlier when I did the demo, the business view is something that can be a rumor. It can be manually documented, like how we did, or you could try to give because this, the whole idea is to give a map. So instead of actually putting document like how we did it, you could actually try to give just a URL to your link kit card or you know Jira ticket number or whatever, wherever your requirement is being captured in its form. So the idea is not to increase the work of documenting things uh, separately. It's basically to give you a, a pointer as to where you will find the details about this particular requirement. The components involved is something that generally we try to maintain manually because obviously as, as you're going to start building microservices, you would want to know how what microservices are interacting with each other at this point. This is the interesting bit, the development view. Now in the development, so before I continue, I want to make sure people understand service discovery that I'm talking here has nothing to do with the service discovery that normally people understand because I have had these questions before. Is it the same thing? No, it's not. The service discovery that I'm talking here is a service discovery required to understand what microservices are running in your system. So when I'm saying that, I'm, I'm not sure how many people know about PACT, but this diagram is something that we try to give from a PACT broker. So what it does is you can see which are the consumers and which are the providers in this diagram. So these are all live running microservices. And this is, these are facts. So what you see over here, this diagram, which I've taken from uh, PackBroker, is fact. 
So you can see how different consumers are interacting with different providers in the system. And if at all I change something, the diagram, and I refresh the diagram, this is going to change. So these are facts. If I click on one of these arrows here, unfortunately I'm not able to show you a demo of this. If I click on one of these arrows here, it is going to show me what is the contract between this consumer and this provider. So this is an example of how we can present the facts. Similarly, there are other, other ways in which we can collect the facts. HTTP access logs to understand which services are being accessed. There can be special gems written. So we had a special gem which we had written internally to radiate that information outside from the services that are running into production. We can also use Docker registry now. Docker being the new thing to implement. You can use the Docker registry to get information about microservices that are running in production. The operational view. In the operational view, I've just shown four four key things, but there are actually much many more that could be shown here. The first thing is SLAs. Now, in many many organizations I've seen, people don't really bother about documenting SLAs anywhere. But the way we did it at, at REA was in the special gen that I mentioned, which reads the data out of the running service. It actually reads some data from the readme, in which we had built a template, and in that you can specify one part where you should specify the SLA required for the microservice. Because obviously some of your microservices may be required to run only during business hours and some might be required to run 24-7. And it's important that you have that information cataloged and available to an operational person or anyone who is carrying the pager readily available to understand what is it, what is the SLA for this particular system. The troubleshooting guide, it can be just a URL for whatever way you are trying, you're documenting your troubleshooting so people understand how to fix issues if they happen, especially in the nights. Infrastructure and deployments. Again, this can be a one-time documentation and links can be adequately provided to understand how do I deploy, what is my infrastructure, how do I go and keep up things. Most important is a catalog of microservices. So as I showed you earlier in the demo, if you have a good catalog of what are the different microservices that are running and how are they interacting with each other, it gets very simple for anyone to go and troubleshoot them at any point in time. Also, some of the things that are missing here, which, which generally we provide through our readme's or through some other way of documentation, is links to the new relic or links to Splunk logs. So, those are the, so, so the idea of treasure map is not to duplicate things that are already existing. It's more to give direction on where to look for information at any given point in time. And especially with you know, when you have like more than 50 or 100 microservices in your ecosystem, it's really important to understand what is the Splunk URL that I need to go and check? What is that NAGEOS that I need to look at? So once you have all those URLs in place, it's very easy to navigate through the system. So th this is the state that we are in right now. So we have the rumor mill. So I'll explain what, what exactly happens in the rumor mill. So if you see, most of the data, you don't really need any data to be real time. If you know that you're, if you know where to look for, then it's enough. Because, for example, if I know the Splunk URL, obviously I can go in Splunk and look for the real, real time information about the system. I don't need to have the real time information available just in one place. So what the rumor mill does is just another microservice. It, it reads the file stores that we are providing and it takes the data from the different file stores. Now, all this data is aggregated and pushed into a graph DB, which is Neo4j. So the reason why we, we are using Neo4j is if you look at the nature of the data that we are collecting, it's very diverse. There's, you cannot just say that you need to have a data in this, you know, in this format because every system is going to radiate data in different formats. So the best way to actually represent the data was looking at the tuples, or if, if, you, if you have heard about RDF tuples, that's, when we, that's where we started actually, and then we replaced it with a graph database like Neo4j to integrate all that information into one system. So when I'm saying RDF tuples, if you see, it's very simple to express something in a form of subject, predicate, and object. So it's more like a language, right? So if I say, for example, my account managers is a microservice. So if I just break it down like this, and I, I start relating this data with each other, it gets very simple to represent it. And 
also makes very simple to then finally integrate it in a database like Graph, like Neo4j. So that's why we chose that, but this was like a very recent addition. Initially we started with just files, keeping the data in form of tuples and reading it using RDF libraries. So that, that's basically the way, the state that we are at with different microservices collecting data from different systems and pushing it into one common location. And then the treasure map, the UI that I showed you is built off this, which is just a simple CRUD. It's not even, it's not even a, a CRUD, it's just read only over this uh, graph database. So that, the reason why I'm not stressing so much on the UI is because UI is just a means to an end. If you can have different ideas of radiating that information outside, you can use WordPress, for example, to keep a rolling, you know, a rolling way of keeping that information. Or you can use uh, SMS if you want to, to really, really trouble somebody. But, so basically, whichever format you want. So you can imagine how do you want to radiate that information out of this graph database. That's why I said UI is least of concern. You can think of whatever way you want to radiate that information. I think, so I've, I've blogged about the treasure map on the REA tech blog, just in case if you have not read about it. And the second very interesting book which I find was documenting software architectures. So in this book, they have very, very well explained the different views on how you can document and how, basically it's, it's quite boring there. But if, <laughs> if you really want to, I, I, I read it at one point. Uh, it gave me a lot of ideas, but yeah, that, that's a good book. That's it, that, that was my talk. Yes, we did try that at one point, but again, like I said, it's up to up to you what you want to use. Okay. So, so the whole idea with, with, with so the one brilliant idea that we had with rumors was to put an expiry date on each of them, so you know till what point I can be given this, or you know after that my confidence level can decrease, and then I can even have like a version control history to say, okay, this is fine, this is as of this day. Is there a previous version to this? So I can refer to that. So yeah, we had a lot of these, you know, how do we represent, that, that's the most challenging part if you see in this whole thing. How do you represent data so that it doesn't get obsolete especially. I guess, I guess, just quickly add to that, I think conference is really cool because you can transport Yes, yes. Definitely. Um, the data file that you showed in the demo, was that manually created or is it automatically created? Some part of it was automated, some part of it was manual. So basically whatever I showed you was coming out of the graph, the new project. So some part of it was manually you know, taken from documents, some of it was automatically being generated. So yeah, that, I know there are a lot of limitations in that because, like I mentioned, we had this talks going on on how we can put some more information about the data itself, like whether it is manual or automated, or you know, like I said, expiry dates or time to live or those type of you know some flags on there, so people really might just know what how, how far they should believe in that data. Sort of following on from that, how much of um of the documentation is, is automatically generated or you know, relying on annotations and, and things driven from the code to, to sort of feed into that um, UI that you showed? So, like, a, okay, from, from the UI, the, the graph that, mm -hmm. the, the diagram that was generated was obviously not, it was automatically generated, right. but the descriptions and some part of the business requirements was all manually entered. So we, the way we did it at one point was we had we had like a, a JSON template where uh, people used to fill out their JSON template and that was directly injected into the graph because we did not have all those different microservices which would collect the data. So yeah, we started from a very crude idea and then we are still, like I said, it's, it's a very challenging thing to actually think about how to integrate all this. 
so a couple of years ago when I was at, at REA, that's when you guys started on the uh, yes. on, on that journey, and you used a gem uh, to expose an endpoint on each service that you were yes. building to to for it to tell what other systems it was interacting with. So therefore, you know, you could build a graph off that. But it seems like you've moved away from that and moved towards using the PAC broker as the, the source of truth. And that's yes. because you're using PAC for all your yes. interaction tests. So yes. have you moved away from, like, you, you did mention the gem, but have you moved away from that more towards it? So is there more so trust the in the PAC? So the integrations, yeah. the integrations between uh, the consumers and the providers, yeah. we rely completely on the PAC broker. Yeah. But the information about the systems itself, which is not going to, so the information that doesn't change radically yeah. over a period of time is something which you can manually maintain. And that bit is still radiated out using the gym. Oh, okay. yes. So the information that's obviously changing continuously, like facts. Yeah. We, are, we are no longer relying on manual manual. Yeah. come into play, it's not just number of developers. Because if you see culturally at REA, people hate documentation. And I'm included in that. I, mean, I hate it. Really. But the, that's why I asked in the beginning, how many, how much time has gone since you have written your first microservice? service? Because if, if you move away from that system for some time, obviously it gets very hard for you to understand what's going on, especially if you're new in a microservices world. So that's where this helps because the, the the demo that I showed you, I'm no longer working in those systems now, but I still get people coming to me and asking me, you know, what, what do you know? You, I saw your name on that comment. Can you tell me what's going on? And I'm like, that was two years ago. I'm no longer working there. But obviously, obviously then I look at this, you know, pretty man, and I'm like, yeah, that that looks okay. This, you know, I, this is still happening, and I can then trace it back. So that's where it helps because as time progresses and as people move away from systems, you require this type of breadcrumbs left behind so that it's easy for you to navigate your way back. I think that's that's the most important thing. Okay. All right. Thank you. I guess um, there's a big talk about when you move to microservices about service ownership and custodianship yes. of systems and services that make up systems. And, and it's a problem that I think everybody that's moving to microservices is still dealing with. How are you, so is this sort of a counter act or a, or a counter to having to have teams remain on and being custodians of systems? This is sort of or a supplement to that, if you know what I mean? Yeah. So. If you see, um, again, I actually go back and show. You see over here, you can see the custodian mentioned, and the team still exists. So obviously, if I go and search in search for that team, there would be people might have changed. Like I said, like I moved out of a lot of these teams actually myself, but the team still exists, and I can go and ask them questions around around this. So 
uh, we, we do have custodianship model going in REA. There's a lot of, lot of experimentation happening in that space as well, but at least this is one way of finding out who to ask if I have questions about this microservice or like we have a lot of cases where people have come to me and asked me, I know you wrote that service, I, I know the endpoint, can I, can I use it now because I have this requirement where I require to use the, you know, the information from that endpoint. So that's where generally we refer back here to say, okay, what, what was that endpoint? Is it still happening? To see whether it's, it's still in production, how is it working and all those things. So that's where this, this really helps. So you, you avoid duplication in a way because obviously you don't want two microservices doing the same thing. So this, this helps a lot in that way. Especially when you have like lots of microservices in your technology. 